Wait a second. Hello and welcome, Oop, Julian. <laughs> let me know if I should start. You can make start. an appearance and let us know. Start. Okay, great. Hello and welcome back to Blitz Scaling a Startup. I'm Chris Ye, and I'm here for this particular interview without Julian. He's decided to remain in the background as the voice of God as necessary. But don't worry, we have an absolutely amazing guest, Eduardo Bresenio. We have a lot of things in common. I can't wait to talk about him, talk about his new book, The Performance Paradox. But before we begin, Eduardo, I mentioned this when we were talking before we began. You are in the Happiness Hall of Fame. Can you tell me about that? Sure. And Chris, it's, it's an honor to meet you. It's so fun to be here with you. So thanks for having me. Uh, the Happiness Hall of Fame is... Um, a, a nonprofit that acknowledges people that are spreading happiness in the world. And so I was doing a keynote one day and afterwards somebody approached me and say, hey, you know, I want to tell you about the Happiness Hall of Fame. We want to induct you in it. And the reason it's it's actually really meaningful to me is that I grew up very unhappy. I didn't like the way the world was. And, um, and so one of the things that I'm most proud of is just the change that I have made in myself to be happy, to generate you know, positive emotions from within myself and try to uh, radiate them. Wow. Well, that is an interesting thread that I, I can't help but pull on. Tell me about growing up unhappy, because obviously you seem like a very happy guy, very accomplished, although as we all know, those external extrinsic motivators are not the main drivers of happiness. But, you know, it sounds like the, the situation in the world had you down when you were young. Talk about that, because I think a lot of people today feel a sense of despair looking at the world around them, wondering what's going to happen to them, and maybe your journey can help them. Yeah, and part of it was what you said that I, I always didn't realize it, but I, I had the assumption that my happiness was a function of my circumstances. And so in order to become happy, I needed to, you know, eventually when I became an adult, I needed to get promotions. I needed to get to a, a certain place and then I would be happy. And that was just not the right way, way to think about it, I think. But so growing up earlier when I was a kid, I just saw it seemed like a lot of people were inauthentic. They 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 put a face in front of other people and then behind their back, they would say something else. And so I would see, you know, the way I perceived the world was not a place that I liked. There was a lot of things that I saw in the world that I didn't like, and that got me down. And I also didn't know, I didn't feel a sense of agency. And part of it, which connects to some of your work is that I didn't know anybody who was an entrepreneur or mm. who really thought that they could change their their world or communities or the 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 the, the, the make an impact you know I, I did not know i grew up in venezuela and uh, my dad worked in the same big company for 30 years and it just wasn't in in my school or anywhere they didn't teach me really leadership in terms of you know envisioning a different future and driving toward it to affect change so eventually when i became an adult i i realized eventually that well, what happened is my body broke down. I got a, a significant um, health issue called myofascial pain syndrome. It's a repetitive strain injury where it became really painful to, in my case, to use the keyboard, to use the mouse, to drive, to to br brush my teeth. Oh my to open goodness. Doors. Yeah, and, and, and I didn't really mind pain because I realized that I had gotten very used to working really hard through pain. I was, I was you know, I had a very high perseverance. But what really scared me is that I met people with my same condition who couldn't use their hands for more than five minutes, for 10 minutes a day. And without my hands, I realized, you know, I, I didn't know how to do anything. You know, am I going to become disabled? I was in my 20s. And I got a bit of a sense of mortality, not, not that I was going to die, but that I wasn't, wasn't going to be able to do anything with my hands. Um, and so I, I went on that kind of like a, it was a quarter life crisis. I started reading books and trying to find answers. And one of the books that I read was called The, the Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. And I realized there, wow, you know, first of all, it's okay to pursue happiness as a central goal in my life. That's something that I it hadn't been, become clear to me. Um, and second, happiness is something that I can work on myself to change myself. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be just through changing my circumstances. So that was kind of part of my path. And so when I think about a lot of the um, challenges that are in the world right now, like you talked about, I think part of what gives me hope is first, you know, a lot of things, right? But one of them is focusing on my sense of agency and how I can improve 
kind of my life and the life of those around me and and try to make an impact even just by being kind right just by being kind imagine how great the world would be if we were just kind to each other so i can make it i, I can make a contribution on that but also and i know you're a big fan of kind of psychology you know a lot of the negative gets accentuated both by social media and the news, but also by our psychology. And so mm -hmm. just remembering and starting every morning with gratitude, focusing on the amazing things that I can be grateful for, just like life and being on earth, you know, and 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 so much health and and life and peace um, and and all the learning that we can do is part of it, which is what we'll part of what we'll talk about today. So that helps me kind of set up my emotions to 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 be in a positive state every day, which days are what makes of our life. So that's part of what I do to foster my own happiness. And as we know, we cannot control all the external circumstances, but to borrow from stoicism, we can't control our reactions and we can at least affect the way that we think about things. It sounds like you've got a great gratitude practice that really helps you get a great start in the day. How long do you spend on that? Is it just a couple of minutes? Is it like a structured thing? What do you do? It's just a couple of minutes, maybe it takes like four minutes or so, and it is pretty structured. I give thanks to for the things that are most gr that are most important to me. So it's mm -hmm. like life, health, love, and peace, as opposed to the death in the world and the hate in the world and the war in the world. I want to also pay attention to the good. So those are the, it kind of helps me put in perspective like all those other challenges that we might have in entrepreneurship and other places, like you know, these things are things to be grateful for. So I do that um, in like first like the immediate immediate family, then the extended family, and then the whole world. Um, and I also like so I've I've evolved this a little bit over time and in in there I give thanks for the peace for those who have passed away and that has mm. helped me shape my relationship with death um and then after that i say uh, you know uh i am grateful for all the things i get to do today rather than i have to do today and then i think about what are some of those things that i get to do today and that varies every day and it can be either big philosophical things like i get to live or uh like you know small things of the specific things that i get to do that day uh, I love that. And I think those are really practical tips that can help our listeners. Now, thinking about the chronology of things, you mentioned, again, developing this debilitating condition. Have you been able to find a cure and manage it? It seems like you're able to travel the world and, and give talks. What ended up happening there? Yeah, I, I was able to get back to 100% health, uh, luckily, but it took a lot of work because uh, before, this, before this quarter life crisis and health crisis, I realized I used to think of my body as a car that I could abuse and I could just take to the mechanic and the doctor would fix it. And that's that's how it how always worked for me. And then I and at that point, so when I started feeling this, I didn't feel concerned. I would go to the doctor and they would fix it. The problem is that, you know, first I went to orthopedist and, and I, we, did, we did physical therapy for a few months. And then at some point he said, you know, this is not working and I'm not sure what you have. Go to this uh, surgeon. And then the surgeon said, you know, a lot of surgeons would perform surgery on you. They would say you have carpal tunnel syndrome. I can tell you for sure you don't have carpal tunnel syndrome. So don't let them put give uh, uh, kind of, you know, put the knife in you. But I don't know what you have. And so then I started going to all these doctors. They didn't know what I had. I started then looking for other answers. Like I started using acupuncture and going to meditation retreats. And, and just the, the fact that it was really hard to diagnose um, was... Part of what made me go through a big journey uh, to learn not just about what I had, but also the root causes and how to live. And eventually, yeah, I, I went to DC for when, once I learned what I had, I went to DC and I got this treatment every day for six weeks called uh, dry needling. And I stretch for an hour and a half every day for three years. I used speech recognition for three years. So it took a lot of effort, but I was able to heal back to 100%. Got it. And I'm so grateful and glad to hear that. And it, like you said, it wasn't just a question of going to see doctors. It was a question of changing your life. And also, again, the work that you did in terms of mindset, in terms of approaching, that sounds like it was really helpful. And was this happening during the time that you were a, a venture capitalist? I believe you were over at, at CSFB and you were uh, uh, investing in companies. And all of a sudden, I mean, that is a big shift. Did it cause you to change your career as a result? Because obviously you've dramatically pivoted. It did, yeah. I was working at 3000 Sand Hill Road as a venture capitalist, like you're saying, and um, it was a great experience. I worked with amazing entrepreneurs and investors. Um, but in this 
crisis, part of what I realized is that I didn't feel a sense of purpose mm. um, and I didn't feel like I was making a difference in the world because in, and so, so, and my wife became a teacher and she, I, I saw when she became a teacher, she found her purpose in a way that I realized, wow, I don't have that for myself. I want that for myself. Um, but part of what was happening, Chris, because is that I was feeling very inauthentic and pretending every day because mm. unlike you, I, I had never been like, I didn't have a lot of expertise I felt to share with CEOs, even though I was, I was participating in board meetings, I was listening to what other investors would say and I would just repeat it. And I didn't know why that was good <laughs> advice. Um, or, you know, when we were evaluating pitches, you know, after when we were debriefing, I was pretending to be sure one way or the other when I was not sure. I had like, you know, lots of yes buts in my mind. And so this, this a lot of pretending was creating a lot of stress in me. Yeah. That was part of the whole thing that I had to figure out. So I went to grad school to figure out a different path that worked better for me and, and, and gave me a sense of meaning. And that's where, you know, I met my mentor, Carol Dweck, and I started doing the work that I do now. Wow. And of course, uh, when you went to school, this was for your graduate degrees, you went to my alma mater, Stanford University, one of the greatest schools in the world. And you did both an MBA and an MA in education studies. So you went in knowing, hey, this is going to be a change. Or did you uh, sort of pivot partway through to talk about that for a bit? No, I definitely went not having the answer of what I would do, but with an interest in social entrepreneurship and education. I wanted to do something that I felt, you know, it was very different. It was very much outside of my comfort zone, um, but I wanted to explore. And Stanford was a fantastic place to study on social entrepreneurship and work on different projects. Uh, so that's, uh, I didn't know what, what I was going to end up doing, but I wanted to change and to do something in social entrepreneurship or education. Yeah. And of course, you, know, you ended up working with the great Carol Dweck. I don't actually know Carol personally, but I've been following her work ever since it first burst on the scene. And I don't mind telling you that in our old house, one of the few things I had on the wall for the kids was a poster about the growth mindset, because I just felt it was so important to reinforce this over and over again. It's so easy to get caught up in the fixed mindset. And it's just must have been amazing working with Carol at such an exciting time. Talk a little bit about that. And what did you take from that that then informs the way you, you work and live today? Well, I took so much from that and it was amazing. But, you know, starting with reading her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, I just learned about growth mindset and fixed mindset. And growth mindset is when we when we understand that we can develop ourselves and our abilities and qualities can change versus a fixed mindset might be when we think that entrepreneurs are naturals. You're a natural entrepreneur versus not versus you can become a better entrepreneur, for example. Um, and so in reading that work, I realized that I I tended to be in a fixed mindset about a few different things in my life, like social interactions or athletics um, or happiness is an example of that and how that had gotten in the way of my goals. So the first impact was just impact of becoming more self-aware on how my thinking was getting in the way of my goals. Um, and then I just went on a big journey. We co-founded an organization called Mindset Works that I was a CEO for for 10 years. So having Carol and others in, in my board and learning from them, learning from the people that we serve, learning from continuing to kind of dive deeper into the research and just going on a journey. And then in that journey, something that I also didn't plan for is it, it became more more important for me to become a public speaker and be an, mm -hmm. a, a, a voice for growth mindset. And so that also shifted uh, my path. But uh, I, I continue to have Carol as a, as a treasured mentor and continue to learn from her. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm enormously jealous because I think that her work is fantastic. But obviously, what you've done is you've been able to extend that work. And you know, I have a similar relationship myself. I work very closely with my friend Reed Hoffman. And you know, part of the thing that you discover if you're Reed Hoffman or Carol Dweck is you can only be in one place at one time. And having uh, a collaborator like you to extend the work and and to be able to get the message out there into the world when she can't is an incredible value. So I'm sure while it's an honor to work with Carol, it's also great for her, for you to be collaborating and working together. Yeah. And it's part like in your community too, is a part of a broader community of amazing yeah. people who are doing really cool things. And, uh, and uh, so it's, it's an honor to be part of it. Well, let's talk about the performance paradox because we've teased it long enough. It's time to give the audience what they want. The performance paradox is your 
relatively new book, although I believe it stems from some TED Talks that you gave as well. And when I watched your TED Talk and heard about the performance paradox, I'm like, this is just one of those brilliant, simple, yet counterintuitive insights that can completely change the way that people look at performance and how they perform versus how they learn. So talk to me about the origin story of the performance paradox. When did this distinction uh, first come to you and how did that eventually grow into a book? Because I think the TED talk you did about this was you know, uh, some number of years ago. The book finally came out, I think last year or maybe the year before that. Talk about the gestation of the performance paradox. Yeah, so TED Talk came in 2016, and and the book came out last year in September. And it it this idea was seeded when I was working um, on Mindset Works, and we were trying to kind of evangelize growth mindset, and it was still some a term that was relatively unknown. Um, and at the time, most of the people in the kind of growth mindset ecosystem, the early adopters, the champions talked about performance as something that was negative. There's a, there's a line of research that says there's learning goals and performance goals. And when we have performance goals, um, especially a certain type of performance goals, we tend to have some of the same dynamics as a fixed mindset where we, we don't learn as much, we don't experiment as much, we, we withdraw when we experience failure, for example. Um, and so, but in conversation with Carol and with my partner, Lisa Blackwell and others, and Anders, Anders Ericsson, it, it, it eventually I had the aha moment through conversations that performance is really necessary and it's really important. It's how we get things done. It's how we yes. contribute. And, and in trying to then explore like how and when should we focus on performance, how and when should we focus on learning, um, is something that I started kind of thinking about and then prototyping, right? In workshops, like I was doing a lot of workshops with uh, business leaders and other professionals and I shared different frameworks with them. When I shared with them that distinction, that just, it just generated a lot of insight, a lot of great discussions and alignment. And so then that's when I realized, cause I had done another TEDx talk on growth mindset in 2012. But when I saw people's eyes light up, when I was sharing this framework with them, I thought, oh, you know, this is another TEDx talk that I need to share. And that's what led to the TEDx talk. And then once that became popular, then uh, the book opportunity came, came about last year or, you know, three years ago. Yeah, no, and, and that's one of the things, right? I think that the, the two are highly complementary. The TED talk and the book are very complementary. They really feed into each other because... I had done a TEDx talk myself. I could talk about the experience that I had there, which hopefully will lead into a new book as well, which I think ties in with your work. Um, but, you know, it you're very limited on time. They tell you, hey, you've got 11 minutes to convey your life's work. Go. I'm like, oh, yeah. wow. Okay, that's, that's kind of tough. Usually people give me an hour, 11 minutes, huh? So <laughs> well, uh, I love it. Yeah. Well, first, I, I love your TEDx talk on Infinite Learner. And uh, thank you for that. And I'm excited for you to be working on this idea and, and expanding it into a book. I can't wait to learn from it. Well, I think. But yeah, but, but and the other thing I would say about the 10 minutes is that that first TEDx talk that I did, the fact that it was 10 minutes made it also doable for me because I was very scared to be. Yeah, I was not a public speaker at the time like you are. And so, you know, the idea of getting on stage and talking to a lot of people was scare, very scary for me. But the fact that it was 10 minutes and I could work hard and create a script and memorize it, that made it doable for me. Got it. Well, now you are one of like the most popular speakers in the world, I think. I uh, think, how often do you speak and where can people find out if they really want to catch you in person? Well, yeah, I speak like two to three times a month and I, I love it. I think it's, uh, it's completely surprising to me that this is the work I do now. Uh, but my website is brisenio.com. I'm, I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I love it when people connect. Excellent. So thinking about like the intersection of TED Talks, public speaking, books and the like, you know, I'm early in my journey. My TEDx talk just recently came out. What should I be doing? I'm going to use this opportunity interview as an opportunity for me to learn from you. What are uh, what are the things, some of the things I should do to follow up on having a, a TEDx talk out there? What can I do to make it as effective as possible? Well, I think you did an amazing step by having a great TEDx. So it's really valuable. So that's congratulations on that. Well, thank well, you. I'll, I'll start with like, what are your goals? What do you want to achieve? What are you, what, what are you looking for? 
Well, I would say that the idea behind doing the Infinite Learner TED Talk is primarily to hopefully lead into the Infinite Learner book, but also to get the ideas out into the world in a way that, you know, sometimes a book cannot, right? Blitzscaling is a best-selling book, but it does not reach nearly as many people as a TED Talk that gets millions and millions of views. And so to me, it was very important to meet people where they were. I think the other element of it is obviously it's an idea I really believe in, but then from an instrumental perspective, effect instrumental purpose it's also uh, a way for reed and i to do something that is a little different so we've historically focused on business content purely business content and i think infinite learner is really strong for business just like growth mindset the performance paradox are very strong for business but i think it's also of interest to a general audience in a way that something like blitz scaling might not be so that was one of the other goals. The hope is that it leads into something like what you've had, which is you, know, you have a book out there, you have a talk out there, there are audiences around the world who are benefiting as a result of having gotten this very key insight. In your case, you know the distinction between the learning zone and the performance zone, and in the case of Infinite Learner, understanding that you have to unlearn the lessons of your own success. Yeah, I, I um, so for me, this is this is my this book that I that I released a few months ago is my life's work, like you said, Infinite Learner. You described the TEDx talk as your life work, um, and so the process of writing the book, which you've done several times, uh, was super helpful for me to uh, continue to develop the ideas and make them clear and crystallize them and figure out how to communicate them. So you've gone through that process, but I interviewed over a hundred people. It was a great kind of learning opportunity for me and getting feedback on the manuscript. Um, if working on illustrations helped me come up with new frameworks. Uh, so as you know, the process of writing the book was a great way just to develop, continue to develop the ideas and share them. Um, the TEDx in particular, it might be useful when kind of to see how people respond to it, what um, where people are confused, like in the comments that they make, for example, in YouTube uh, or other places, or um, what questions do people ask? How, where are they confused? Where is it resonating? Uh, so that's that's one value of the TEDx talk. Uh, and then when developing the book, I found it helpful to do the work in parallel. So not, I mean, I kind of got into a cave for three years to work in the book, but I was still doing public speaking at a lower level of intensity. I'm doing workshops. Right. And so in those, just like in entrepreneurship, I think in sharing some of the ideas and seeing how they land and and also continuing to learn. And, and as I'm reading other books, I think about, oh, I should talk about this topic, but here's something that I can contribute as different. And then sharing those frameworks with other people to get their feedback. So just the whole process of developing the book, I felt was a way to continue to advance the work. Don't know if that resonates with your experience. Of, no, I think I think it absolutely does. I mean, I think that the thing about writing a book is you are forced to be much more clear and you cannot cover up uh, any lack of clarity with you know, brilliant stagecraft and wonderful delivery. And I, having watched your TED Talks, I know you rate at both of them, um, but the ideas themselves have to carry the weight in a book form. And so it's a great discipline. It's also, as you have experienced incredibly hard work and it takes yes. a long time and you do en uh, end up crawling into a cave. I do want to mention, it looks like we've got a comment from one of our listeners and viewers, Ali Pardian, who says, great interview. Thanks, Chris and Eduardo for being so candid. Uh, thank you, Ali, for writing in with your comment. And I do think, you know, you can tell from having heard Eduardo's story that being authentic is really important to him as it is to me. And maybe that's a, a worthwhile thing to explore. Why is it that authenticity is so important? And how can people gain the, the courage to be authentic? How can they take those baby steps in that direction if they're used to putting on a face for the world? Yeah, a great. I love the question. And it ties into a few a few years ago, I went to a workshop with a, a group of what, what they call learning omnivores is the name of the group. And we talked about with we worked on our values to try to make our values more explicit. So the the three top values that I came up for myself were authenticity, learning and contribution. And then if I had to put a fourth, I would put kindness. Um, but authenticity became really important for me because um, growing up as a, as a young person, I felt one of the things that I really disliked in the world was when people were not authentic, when they were not 
they were putting a face in front of other and they people. They were phonies. And they were phonies. And, and I felt like I needed to be a phony in order to fit in. So, for example, in school, the, the cool thing to do was to not do well in school and to be disruptive. And or even in some case, like in a lot of cases, is to be mean to other people like that, that would give you a higher social status. And so I've just and through that and through even venture capital, pretending to know more than I did, pretending to be sure I was just always pretending and that got to breaking my body. And so one of the things I learned is just the value of being authentic and honest and, and just sharing my thinking and my emotions with other people. It, it creates a lot less stress for me, but also deeper relationships. You know, when when I talk about things, even in things that are um, hard to share, that that the other person might be difficult for them to hear. It often that honesty and and the the sharing leads to eventually deeper relationships and people actually like respecting you and, and and appreciating you. So that's in terms of authenticity. That's some of the things that led me to have that be one of my three core values. Well, in terms of being candid, I guess I would ask this question. Was there any time when being authentic cost you something? I mean, it, it sounds great. And if it's all positive, that's wonderful. But probably people are worried, hey, if I'm authentic, am I going to lose the people that I currently have relationships with? Is there going to be fall blowback or fall out? Fall out? T tell me about that. Yeah, no, that, that's a great um, comment. I know you and Julian have talked about this before. Uh, and you talked about in, in this podcast. And you've talked about, for example, when when you agree with other people, they tend to like you. When you disagree, they tend to dislike you. And so uh, that's that's something to consider and whether you have a deep relationship with a person or not. Um, so I would say in the workplace, for example, one thing that um, that sometimes people feel uncomfortable with is when we share anything that's in our mind or our hearts, like sometimes it deviates from the work we have to do. Uh, and so one consideration is, is what I'm sharing relevant to our shared goals, right? Or is it going to detract from our shared goals? Uh, so that's one thing that I consider. Um, so sometimes I withhold some things, right? But I try to, what I share, I try for that to be true, right? As opposed to sharing things that are not true. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I have to share everything or to be comprehensive in 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 the level of um, transparency. I think transparency is something I talk about in the book. It's super super important both for both learning and performing. It helps us learn and perform better. Um, but you know, if we share everything, then that can also detract. And so we need to also have judgment as to how much we share. I don't know if you want to add anything to that because I know you've thought about this as well. No, I would. I think I would just echo what you said, which is that transparency is a tool like anything else, and you can optimize it. I think it's very easy, and this ties in with sort of the infinite learner theme. There's this great comfort that we feel in certainty and in saying something like, honesty is the best policy, and I must always speak the truth. And it's much easier to enforce a principle like that. But that doesn't mean that that makes you a good person. It doesn't mean that that's the kindest thing that you can do. That's why I think it's so telling that you mentioned kindness as sort of like the fourth value that you hold, because there are times when authenticity and kindness come into conflict and you have to balance the two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I remember the name of the episode was uh, Should Entrepreneurs Lie? I think it's the name of the episode with, that, of your conversation <laughs> with Julian on this topic that I really enjoyed and learned from. Oh, wonderful. I got to tell you, you know, this is very impressive. We have uh, a number of famous folks like yourself as guests on the podcast, but not all of them can cite individual episodes that they've listened to. So that is truly impressive. Um, so let's talk a little bit more just because, you know, we go, we, we have so many different topics to talk about, but I want to circle back to the performance paradox, which again is your book that came out last year. Where can people find the book? Where can they, I believe they can even get a sample chapter for free? I mean, my God, you're giving it away. So where can they find the performance paradox? Yeah, well, it's available wherever books are sold. You know, Amazon or Audible. It's, a, it's a, an audiobook as well, Kindle. Uh, but the chapter one, yeah, is freely, openly available on my website. Or you can go to theperformanceparadox.com and scroll down to the bottom, and there's the table of contents in the full first chapter. Fantastic. And let's say that there are people out there in the audience who are really interested in helping you. Maybe they want you to come and speak, or maybe they think their company can use your help. Uh, where do they go? I assume they go to bresenio.com, 
but where on the website should they go? And by the way, that's B-R-I-C-E-N-O. Yeah, they you know there's a contact us uh, uh, link there. They can uh, or they can also email me Eduardo at Yeah. So now since we're at the halfway point in the interview, it's also a good time to shift to another topic of halfways, which is midlife. So you and I are pretty close to the same age. I think I might be a couple of years older, but it's not that different. And my friend Chip Conley, who runs the Modern Elder Academy and who has written a couple of books about being a modern elder, uh, has written about midlife. And of course, you know, your alma mater, Stanford, my alma mater, as well as my alma mater, Harvard Business School, often talk about how, you know, oftentimes when we get to this point in our lives, we've accomplished a lot. Again, I think that that's pretty safe to say you've accomplished a tremendous amount in your career and in your life. But when you get to this point, it starts to become time to think about the second half and to think about legacy. Uh, I'm curious, you know, with somebody who has such deep understanding of humanity, of psychology, how are you thinking about midlife? How are you thinking about what's next for Eduardo? Sure. And so it's funny you bring up Chip Conley and Modern Elder Academy. I, um, I have been to Modern Elder Academy. I spent a week there in Baja. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and I've been to the Santa Fe campus also just visiting. Um, and Chip Conley is my mentor. In fact, my book wouldn't have happened without Chip. He's the one who suggested that I write a book. Um, but, uh, you know, it's in this. So 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 his work a lot is about midlife as a transition, as, as a period of a lot of different transitions. And how, how do we become better at continuing to evolve and going from one chapter to the next. So I love your question of like, what's the next chapter for me? I am still kind of wrapping up the book launch and what I want um, then most of kind of the next few months to be is about finding my cadence in terms, cause I was over indexed on the book and on work for the last three years. Cause it was such a big challenge for me to do this book. I was, um, I, I started, kind of not exercising as much as I usually do before the book and like not spending as much time with my family as I used to and I want to. And so I want to wrap up this project and, and then definitely then kind of prioritizing my time with my family and taking care of myself so that then what's a forcing function is the rest mm -hmm. of the time I, I want to make the most of it during work, but rather than the reverse, which is what I was doing the last three years. Exactly. And this is one of the things about you know, some we used to call it work life balance, work life integration, many different terms. But part of it is uh, to borrow uh, older wisdom for everything. There is a season turn, turn, turn. And in your case, you're turning the page on this intensive period of work to get this book out. And of course, there's a tremendous follow up. But I love the fact that you're going to take the time to re-index, to, to spend time with family and to, to recuperate from this sprint that you've been on yeah absolutely um because and it's it's also a time to continue to evolve and so you know the types of opportunities that come as you know like shift and so i have to learn what do i say yes and no to and like what is the cadence and the habits that i'm going to be uh continuing to evolve in this next uh, season well Ta again, to the extent that you're willing to, because you don't have to say anything that you're not willing to say, talk about family, because I think people often see the speaker on the stage, charismatic figure sort of towering over them. They literally have the stage generally above the audience. People are looking up and it's very imposing. But, you know, you're a human being like everyone else. And it sounds like family is very important to you. Talk to me about family and the role it plays in your life. Sure. So first, I'll, I guess I'll say that uh, part of in this kind of quarter life crisis, what I came up with uh, uh, that helped me is clarity around what's important to me in my life. So I came up with a one pager on what is my life about? What am I trying to pursue? And at the center of it is the central kind of pursuit for me, which I call happiness. But, you know, the way I have written it is happiness, fulfillment and appreciation. Mm. And so any, anything that I do in my life is with that pursuit, but happiness can mean different things to different people. So that's why I'm talking about more uh, a long-term and, and more stable form of happiness rather than more sensory and fleeting to type right. of- uh, We're not talking about hedonic happiness or the hedonic treadmill. We're talking about that deeper meaning, fulfillment, purpose kind of happiness. Yes. And so, um, 
And so then around that, there are kind of different strategies that I use to pursue happiness. So, so a deepening bond with, you know, my wife, Allison is one of those things, right? Deepening bond with my extended family, like my parents and my sister, uh, or with my friends, or even our pets are really important to Allison and me. Uh, but also like, you know, energizing invention is something that I, I love to invent new things mm. or, you know, lifelong learning and growth is something else that's a, it's a source of happiness for me. Certainly kind of service and contribution is something that's, very, that's an important source of happiness for me. Um, uh, taking care of my body and my mind and my spirit. Um, so, so I would say, you know, family is part of, is an important part of, um, what I seek to pursue in my life. And it's all with the, cause I, I feel like like life at the end is about creating positive emotions to me. And so these are strategies to, to have a, a positive experience through life. Now I'm curious, is there any place people can find this one page document that you wrote up in your twenties? You should put it on your website. You know, uh, that's a good idea. I should do that. I actually, uh, so there's, um, even better. I think there's, we wrote a chapter for the book that didn't make it into the group, into the book. It's called Ooh. creating time and it's a bonus chapter. And if anybody like contacts me, I'm happy to send it to you. So Eduardo at Briseño.com and the chapter is about creating time. So, because when we, when, when I ask in workshops or keynotes, what's the biggest challenge to engaging in the learning zone and the learning zone is when we leap beyond the known versus yes. the performance zone is when we are doing things as best as we know how or trying we're trying to maximize immediate achievement and so when we, people realize that often we are stuck in chronic performance just trying to do everything as best as we know how as flawlessly as possible and that leads to stagnation, that leads to us not having breakthroughs, but whether in continuous improvement or in radical transformation and innovation. And so when I ask people, what's the biggest challenge to engaging in the learning zone? There's two themes that come up more often. One of them is fear. You know, what are, what are people going to think if I am not flawless, right? If I make mistakes, if I'm vulnerable. And then the second is time. We, ha we have so much to do in so little time. I have to just focus on getting those things done. And so this chapter is about creating time and strategies for that. And part of that, and this is where it ties to your question, is that we need to be clear about what's important to us and mm. what our strategy is, whether our personal life strategy or our, or our business strategy. You know, what's our theory? Like you and Reed and Julian talk about what's my theory of how I go about my life or about my, my investment thesis. Um, and so, so becoming clear on what's important to us is part of how do I make, how do I make the best use of the time I can? Yeah. And I think that I want to underscore just because for those people who haven't yet read the performance paradox, because I rest assured after this interview, people will go out and buy the book and also watch the Ted talk. But one of the important things about the learning zone is that you create an environment where there is a safety net because mistakes are to be expected when you're learning, when you're trying something new, when you're experimenting. And one of the most important things is to be able to create room for that, to create a, a safe space as, as people have started using the term, uh, it, psycho, a sense of psychological safety. So making that happen. So I think that that's great. Looks like we got a question from the stream. A lot of fans, I assume they came in for, for fans of yours as opposed to mine, because I have so few fans in comparison to you. But Melissa Please. Torres asks, what's similar different between Eduardo's work and Chris's TED Talk? Excellent question. Um, do you want to start or do you want, should I start? It's up to you. I, I can start and uh, if you want. Um, so they're very, very um aligned i don't yes. think there's any misalignment um you know chris and and you can talk you know i love your perspective as well yeah. but um chris talks about infinite learner and the importance of being an infinite learner which is what i'm passionate about too uh, i hadn't um i hadn't heard that term before i heard it from chris and i love the term um and chris i would love to for you to explain a little bit on what you mean by infinite um and infinite learner but in terms of you know, Chris, you talk about kind of unlearning and how part of evolution is letting go of the things that we thought in the past or even the things that have worked for us in the past to get to the place that we are. Um, that's certainly um, so. So I think there's so much similarities the 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 to be an infinite learner, we have to engage in the learning zone yes. on a regular basis. We have to create these structures and habits. Um, and so you one of the examples you uh, you give is just artificial intelligence and had that something that we need to 
be an infinite learner and engage in the learning zone in order to figure out like how can I leverage uh, artificial intelligence and how can how do I need to evolve in order to do that. Um, so I would I would say it's uh, it's very very aligned. I don't see any misalignment, but I don't know you know what how you would respond. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I see the the work is incredibly complementary, and I think what it boils down to is the concept of infinite learner, which is a term we came up with mainly because it sounds good. But I use it to refer to being able to learn, unlearn, and then relearn as needed to adapt to the world. Uh, it really ties in well with the learning zone and the performance zone. Uh, as you point out, the performance zone is a place where you're operating to the best of your abilities and trying to be flawless. And that's wonderful. And that's basically leveraging the lessons of the past, right? It's doing something that is familiar where you feel like I've got this, I figured this out. And so, of course, you know, there is a lot to be said for the performance zone. And oftentimes being in the performance zone makes us feel good because if we're really good at what we do, I mean, there's no reason why we shouldn't feel good about that, right? That's something that all of us love when we're doing something that is what we're meant to do. But the point is the world is always changing and things like artificial intelligence and new technologies come around or the world itself changes or you yourself change as you grow and age and your circumstances change and the lessons that made sense for you may no longer make sense i always illustrate this by saying listen whatever lessons you had learned about the world at the age of nine probably don't necessarily apply today right they less they didn't apply when you're a teenager your teenage lessons don't apply to your work and so on and so forth yeah there are some eternal truths and this is reflected in jeff bezos and sort of his talk about amazon where it's like guess what we believe in focusing on what we know will never change people will always want more selection lower prices faster delivery that's great but there are so many other things in this world where you have to learn and what I love is saying, okay, the concept of an infinite learner allows you to recognize when you need to learn. And we help you figure out how to unlearn those lessons. But then you can explicitly in your mind say, I am shifting from the performance zone to the learning zone. And now this is my opportunity. And because I know what I need to do for the learning zone, I need to set up a set of circumstances where there's a safety net. I need to know that mistakes are to be expected. And I think that the notion of the safety net allowing people to overcome their fear of making mistakes is maybe one of the most important elements of the learning zone. So I see tremendous complementarity. I can't wait until at some point in time we're sharing the stage together and doing a talk together. That would be so fun. So, Melissa, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that that's what you were looking for. But if not, feel free to jump in with other questions as well. So Eduardo, you are talking about uh, workshops, you're talking about speeches, you're talking about doing all these different elements uh, of helping people accomplish this. What are some of the things that have surprised you when you've been doing these workshops, when you've been doing these speeches? Because I often think that that's one of the most interesting things, right? People think, hey, these guys know their stuff and they've done it over and over again. But part of what makes it fun is learning new things, uh, new lessons. Like for example, I often gave talks about blitz scaling, and one of the things I talk about is blitz scaling during tough times, and how you know, it's really about relative speed. And I was giving a talk in Sao Paulo in Brazil, and one of the people who heard me give the talk said, "You know, what you really need to do is use the example of the great Brazilian national hero Ayrton Senna, who was a famous race car driver." Because Ayrton Senna said, you know, on a sunny day, I cannot pass 10 uh, competitors, but on a rainy day, I can. I'm like, oh, my God, this is perfect, right? Stuff like that just happens when you're talking. So what are some things you've been surprised by or picked up along the way from your audiences? Absolutely. Well, you know, one thing I do very often is something you've described that Reid Hoffman does, and you probably do the same also, which is just solicit feedback after each talk, right? And so, and kind of push people specifically to what can I do better or what can I do differently? What are, because otherwise, if you just say, how do you, how was that? Then people say, oh, it was great. Um, <laughs> but well, part of what I do, I often do use live polling throughout the session to help people yeah. reflect and write ideas and see what other people are thinking. And when there's time at the end, I do like a public feedback session where I ask people, how did this work for you? And then what can I do differently? And then people start writing whatever they want. And like, I start processing it and commenting on it just to model kind of that getting feedback is really useful and it's not a big deal. Um, and so 
I always learned something, you know, like people might say um, that uh, varying my tone of voice is something that I'm still working on um, or using pauses more effectively. Um, or sometimes I'm trying a new activity because we talked about the learning zone and the performance zone, but I also talk about learning while doing when we are kind of integrating the two. And so in a talk, learning while doing could be I'm doing something that a lot of things I've done before, I know they work really well. But for this particular group, I have this idea that I think might work really well for them. I haven't done this exact thing before. I'm going to try it out, right? Mm -hmm. And so I try by tweaking something often, then I continue to learn and evolve. But then I might learn that, oh, I should have allocated more time for this, right? Um, or, hey, you know, in this particular context, this polling technology doesn't work as well. Um, and so I'm always kind of definitely kind of continuing to learn from people uh, because as a speaker, you want to have an impact on other people. And so by learning what impact you're having, good and bad, then you can continue to get more of the impact that you want. Fantastic. All right. We're getting closer to the end. So what I want to do is I want to shift into some of the questions that you know, we try to ask just about everyone. And the first question would be, what is something that we should have asked about but didn't? Is there any topic that we failed to cover that we really should touch upon before we go? Well, uh, maybe two things come to mind. One is just I don't think that I was clear in like what is the performance paradox. The, the performance paradox is kind of the counterintuitive reality that if we're constantly performing, our performance suffers. So if we want to have higher results, we might just focus on doing things as best as we know how, trying to minimize mistakes, but that's actually not the way to get higher results. That's the performance paradox. Um, and then the other thing that uh, comes to mind is mistakes. You know, sometimes we talk about mistakes as being all good or being all bad. And the truth is that mistakes are really important for learning and trying things that may or may not work and, and, and reflecting and discussing those mistakes, but also mistakes lower performance. And so uh, in the book, I talk about four different kinds of mistakes. Like there's the high stakes mistakes that we want to try to minimize. There's the stretch mistakes, which happen when we're going into our learning zone, trying new things. There's the sloppy mistakes, which we, we also want to try to minimize. They're the things that we should have already learned. And then the aha moment mistakes, which is when we're performing something as best as we think we know how, but then we realized it was the wrong thing to do. And mm. any mistake we make, we can learn from by like reflecting on it and, and soliciting feedback um, and discussing it. But we can be more, what, the key is that we can be more deliberate about making more stretch mistakes by being clear about what you talked about, those safe islands and how we want to engage in the learning zone. Um, and so that we can be clear about also what we want to perf when we want to perform, but also how and when we want to learn. Uh, and a big part of that is learning to get more comfortable with those mistakes. Being obviously, you you never necessarily want to have a, a mistake in any given time. You you know that mistakes are inevitable, but each individual mistake you'd rather it didn't happen. Um, but if you get comfortable with the fact that they are going to happen, it's easier to then reflect on it and extract a lesson from it and learn from it, as opposed to what far too many people do. They view as a sense of shame that they have committed a mistake and they have not been flawless. And that tends to uh, prevent them from taking more chances and from learning from what they've done. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's one other thing that comes to mind, Chris, that might be helpful is um, we, t we talked a bit about this, but to make it more explicit, we talked about a growth mindset, which is the belief that we can change. Mm -hmm. How that relates to the learning zone, the performance zone, the performance paradox is that th there's four things that we need in order to be motivated and effective learners. One is the belief that we can change. That's a growth mindset. Second is knowing how to change and having those systems and habits to change. And the foundation of that is the distinction between the learning zone and the performance zone. Third is we need a why, a purpose. Why, do, why am I going to put effort into the learning zone or the performance zone? And then finally, I, ideally, we want to feel like we belong in a learning community, like the people around us are also learners who want to be infinite learners too and value learning and want to share kind of questions and feedback and mistakes and experiment together. And then we become unstoppable when those four things are true. Ooh, have you created uh, performance paradox circles or, or some form of self-organizing community for the people who are readers of the book or watchers of the talks? 
Well, so what, what ideally what, what, uh, what I help organizations do is to create learning communities in their organization. So mm. you want, you know, if you are an entrepreneur with your colleagues, you want to create the structures for learning and performing so that you are a learning community together. Uh, I have personal learning communities outside of my work with kind of friend tours that we have a call every week, every month or, or every six weeks or every two months. And, and they are spaces for the learning zone. But um, ideally, I think with colleagues, we want to create those learning communities. Excellent. Uh, one last question, and then I will let you go. But uh, of course, we'll follow up offline because since you're here in the Bay Area, again, I find it stunning that we haven't met each other in person before. It's like I... So I'm like, wait a minute, this guy is, Eduardo is like uh, my brother from another mother, as the expression goes. I'm like, how come we haven't met? So we, we absolutely have to find a way to meet here in the Bay Can't Area in, in between our travels. But, you know, Can't wait. the last question I often ask is, I think that we often have this orientation towards young people. They may be in college, they may be just out of college, they may be in graduate school. They have their whole lives in front of them. Maybe that's why it's so irresistible for us to offer advice to them. So in this case, you know, you've won a lot of hard won wisdom. You've gone through crisis and crucible and come out the other side. What would you like to say to young people who are just starting out that would hopefully help them along the way and help them take in some of the lessons you've learned? Well, I mean, first, I, uh, I, as I think, as I know you would say, like, I'm also a learner, so I'm still learning those lessons and life lessons and continuing to, to grow. But what I would say is that I think what I missed early in my career was really being clear on working with people that I could learn from and mm -hmm. just working in, an, in a situation where I could really grow. Like, you know, I have since done from Carol, with Carol Dweck and you've done with Reed Hoffman. Um, but and also for a lot of people are here have kind of entrepreneurship um, aspirations. A mistake I made when I became an entrepreneur is that I just thought that we would figure everything out. You know, we would just learn everything through experiments and through bootstrapping. And what I missed on was getting wisdom from people who knew a lot, who had done a lot of entrepreneurship journeys, who knew in our case, we were selling into school districts, how school districts worked, how sales process works. And uh, we could have accelerated our rate of learning by learning from people who had been there before. And that's one of the things that I appreciate so much from by, of this Blitz, Blitz Scaling podcast is that just by listening to the podcast, you can get a sense of what it's like to be an entrepreneur and what are some of those lessons learned from very experienced people, both investors and entrepreneurs who've been there before. Yes, and thank you so much for that. And again, I think the other point here is that the people who could potentially help you, who can give you that guidance, oftentimes for them, it's a pleasure to be able to work with somebody who's younger and less experienced. It's an opportunity for them to feel like they're contributing. Sometimes I say the greatest gift you can give is to accept a gift from someone else. And so I encourage young people out there to seek out mentors and accept the gift of mentorship. Absolutely. I, you know, that's one of the things that I had to learn is the value of asking for help and how asking for help uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity for somebody else to contribute, but also it leads to a closer relationship. Like sometimes I feel bad asking for, like I used to feel bad asking for help because I felt, you know, it would be a burden on the other person, but actually like it can help us build a relationship and be kind of a win-win. Absolutely. Well, I have had as an amazing guest this session, Eduardo Bresenio. Eduardo, let's hit him one more time with information on where they can find you and where they can find the performance paradox. Sure. The Performance Paradox is available wherever books are sold. Um, and I, um, my website is brisenio.com. I have a monthly newsletter and some free PDFs on how to develop a growth mindset and the learning zone. And uh, I'm active on LinkedIn. You know, if uh, people connect with me on LinkedIn, I always enjoy that. And don't forget, if you ask nicely, you'll get a free copy of the bonus chapter not included in the book on creating time. Something that I insist that you send to me right after this. Great. Absolutely. Awesome. And Chris, I can't wait until uh, we meet in person. I, I, I really admire you so much. I love this podcast and all the work you do. So thanks for all you do. And I look forward to continuing the conversation.
Well, the feeling is mutual. I look forward to it as well. And thank you to all the listeners, especially to those people who chimed in with their various questions along the way. You helped make all this possible. Really glad and grateful to you. And of course, grateful to Julian and the rest of the team for putting this together. Huge thanks for that. And hopefully all of us will be getting together in person sometime soon because Julian is coming to the Bay Area in the not so distant future. So I believe we can all get together. <laughs>